I'm George Galloway, and I present Kale Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kale Mahorra means free words. That's what I speak. So Kale Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kale Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, but discussing the vexed issue of relations between Britain and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, particularly on the issue of arms. As always, we have assembled an audience of distinguished experts and one or two enthusiastic amateurs like me. Now, it's a source of some embarrassment to the Saudi ruling elite that they were picked by a British woman. Gertrude Bell saw something special in the founder of the House of Saud and became his champion in making sure that the British Empire backed his claims to authority in Saudi Arabia rather than anyone else's, even former favorites of the British ruling class. And indeed, the British were uh, decisively important in the conquering of the uh, entire country of Saudi Arabia by the House of Saud and their Wahhabi uh, religious backers, who had been around a lot longer, of course, but who made an historic alliance with the House of Saud and propelled them into the position that they still hold of untrammeled power in the state. Although that power is currently under threat, not least from disinherited members of their own family. So it's not certain that for the rest of this century, as of the last, that the House of Saud will last. But if they don't last, it won't be for the want of trying on the part of Britain and, of course, the bigger, more powerful imperial empire that took over from Britain in the Gulf. The United States adopted our favorite, Ibn Saud, and they made sure that they made plenty of money from the deal. But they made sure, too, that the sinews of strength that have kept the kingdom together and under the rule of a single family which gave even its own name to the name of the state, were well provided for. The United States is by far and away the biggest military supplier and patron of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. But Britain isn't shy of putting its nose in uh, on the deals. The biggest ever arms deal uh, that Britain was ever involved in, indeed at the time it was described as the biggest sale of anything by anyone to anybody was the Al Yamama deal made by Mrs. Thatcher. And the eye watering sums of money were only made uh, more noxious when it was discovered by the British police that actually, virtually the entire deal was a racket whereby the Saudis would give British aerospace uh, a huge king's ransom in money and British aerospace would give them a substantial part of it back in illegal, corrupt kickbacks. The British police were on the trail, both of the company and of the kingdom, in regard to that deal, until Tony Blair threatened, it said, by members of the Saudi royal family, threatened with dire consequences if he did not promptly shut down the police inquiry. The serious fraud office has been in a state of bitter frustration ever since. But just in case that serious fraud office ever thought of doing such a thing again, the Conservative government is pledged to abolish it, though whether they have the votes in the new House of Commons to do so is another matter. Now, all of this would be a fairly sordid story, even if the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was just another common or garden dictatorship. After all, the British 
have no qualms about keeping dictators strong as long as those dictators rule their countries in our interests rather than in the interests of their own people. But in modern times, Saudi Arabia has become a byword for many more sordid aspects of their governance. At the time of recording this, it's said that they are about to crucify and then behead young children for the great crime of demonstrating on the streets for democracy. They are incontestably, and this uh, is also uh, a report in Britain, which has been suppressed by the current government of Britain, they are incontestably involved in supporting extremism and even terrorism in many parts of the world, including our own. They are the fountainhead, the ideological, theological, and financial fountainhead of the spread of extremism, fanaticism, sectarianism, and terrorism all across the world. Nobody seriously doubts that, even when Saudi Arabia, in a classic example of the pot calling the kettle black, tried to finger Qatar as the source of that extremism. Now we have a situation where a woman prime minister of Britain is paying homage at the court of a kingdom where women are not allowed to drive cars, where they are arrested for having too short a skirt in their own home, in their own backyard. We have a woman prime minister in Britain, and we have gay cabinet members in Britain who are in league with uh, a group of people who think the best place for gays is to be thrown off the top of high buildings. We have a group of countries that call themselves democracies who are the principal reason for the continuation in power of a dictatorship where democracy, freedom, is a dirty word. It is the unfreest country on the earth. It is a dire, grim prison state where no liberty of any kind has been allowed to grow in the desert kingdom. But that doesn't stop us keeping them in power. Uh, the campaign against the arms trade in Britain, which does its best to try and inject some sense of morality into what is inherently a fairly immoral trade, uh, recently tried to persuade the British courts that selling weapons to Saudi Arabia was in breach of British law. You see, British law does not allow anyone to sell weapons to anybody if those weapons are to be used either for internal repression or external aggression. The campaign pointed out that the weapons we were selling Saudi Arabia were being used for both to repress internal dissent in the country and to aggress against their neighbors, first Bahrain and then Yemen, as well as quite often without being taken out of the packing case, being sent to Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and other extremist organizations fighting against the government in Damascus in Syria. You'd be surprised, I think, when I tell you that the British court threw out the case and found in favor of the government continuing to issue uh, licenses for the export of deadly weapons to one of the world's deadliest regimes. Now, the campaign are appealing that judgment, and there may be some possibility of victory on appeal, but I myself don't hold out much hope. So, we have this audience, some of whom are real experts on this subject, others merely enthusiastically uh, interested in it. Let's go to the uh, first uh, talker. Yes, Madam, welcome. Thank you very you much. You were a yeah. YouTube sensation the last time you were on this show. 
Thanks for your kind comments. Uh, so good afternoon to you and uh, good to be here back and on this particular subject is very important and I'm glad I'm here because I haven't had the chance to comment on this in the media last week. I have a lot to say about it. Why has this case been lost? It takes us back to how our government is operating. It has hijacked the judiciary. And the hijacking of the judiciary has happened from around the Blair days for your good, good people like your good self have gave, given up their careers in politics because of that, to, to make a principle to stand against that. And the judiciary has been hijacked to the extent that we have secret hearings. So in the case of campaign against Armstrong, for example, there was an entire week where there was a discussion of the case with the intelligence, with lawyers of the government, and uh, government officials and the judges, and no one else is allowed in there. So we are told that these secret hearings have to take place in order to protect uh, the quality of the intelligence shared with that state, namely uh, the brutal regime of uh, Saudi Arabia, and to protect our own intelligence uh, agencies. I say that this is completely wrong, and it is contrary to the British Constitution, and it shouldn't, allow, it shouldn't be allowed to continue now that we know the sources of this uh, evil thing called terrorism, because because of the fight of terrorism, the judiciary has been uh, shut down, basically, during the last 16 years. We are, we are told that Saudi Arabia is sharing with us intelligence about terrorism. The fact is their definition of terrorism doesn't match ours. Their definition of terrorism is anything and anyone that opposes the king and his brutal system. Uh, by, uh, for example, last week, uh, a well-known sheikh, uh, Hassan Farhan al-Maliki, who is the best antidote to extremist uh, terroristic ideology, has been sentenced to three months in prison and fined 50,000 pounds. Why? Because he's fighting terrorism. So seriously, are the Saudi regime really uh, sharing with us uh, valuable intelligence about terrorism? The answer is resounding no. Um, they are uh, brutalizing the people of the eastern province of uh, Saudi Arabia, the, the, the Shia of Awamiya, al qatif and al Ahsa. We don't see much about this, but there is daily brutalization of how homes being bulldozed and people being butchered. And of course, you've uh, kindly spoken about the poor uh, young children who have been sentenced to death, which effectively is murder. They call, they're calling those little boys terrorists when it is well known worldwide that it, is, is, it isn't in the Shia jurisprudence to commit acts of terrorism or extremism of the kind that we know from the Wahhabi system of the Saudi regime. So our government is basically lying to us when it says it has to continue selling weapons to it. It has to hijack our most important organ of the state, the judiciary, and undermine it and have these secret uh, Kafkaesque hearing and everything that we have uh, known over the years. I know we don't have a written constitution. I know you disagree with me about uh, other matters, about colonial history and past and all of that. I speak as a lawyer, and as a lawyer, I will say that we have a sound system that is well structured, and we had a beautiful system of separation of powers, whereby we used to hold our government to account whenever they stepped out of line. But that has been eroded and taken away, and the British Constitution has become somewhat a joke. We say in English, tell me who your friends are, I'll tell you who you are. So if you're calling the Saudi brutal terrorist regime, because every known terrorism in the world emanates from that regime, either by money or otherwise, uh, if you're telling me that those are your friends and you need to protect them, then I am going to ask myself the question, are you an elective dictatorship or are you a democracy? Core value of British uh, uh, society is, I have been brought up to believe and I accept and value and cherish. Rule of law and democracy, both of these matters have been thrown in the bin by our successive government during like 16 years and more so and worst of all times is around the time of these uh, 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 short, -term, short term thinking capitalists, pro weapons industry lobbyist best friends who have no regard for the interests of this country. And in the long term, the debacle, the disaster, the genocide, the war crimes and uh, crimes against humanity in Yemen is going to hound us for eternity. I'm confident about that. 
This is not my personal view alone. This is the view of international independent NGOs campaign against arms trade itself is aware about these facts and has figures from the UN itself. So are we going to continue allying ourselves with such brutal dictators? Are we going to destroy this country in this way, which is what this government is doing, destroying this country? First, they destroyed all our industries in the 80s when they left us with nothing to produce and export except weapons. And now uh, they, they, they are taking everything else that was left for us, and that is wrong. I think the British people have a right to know what's going on. They need to have a right to stand up and hold this government to account. And it shouldn't have to be left to NGOs who have limited resources to have to use their monies in the courts. You see, justice is there in our system, but it's very expensive to get. The lower court, which is the high court, um, has limited jurisdiction in effect. And I can see why the judges, I don't blame the judges. They have their hands tied behind their backs when you having a secret meeting, when you're being told a pack of lies effectively, in the same way that parliament has been lied to, you have no choice but to agree with them. But at the uh, court of appeal level and higher court level, I am confident there will be, that's highly likely to be, a different outcome because the judges at that level don't have the ambitions to become something or to have something or, or don't worry about their decisions, decisions being criticized in one way or the other. They, are, they have more freedom to do something. So 67% of the British people, according to an ICM poll last weekend, say they do not want our government to be selling weapons to this brutal regime because they are aware of the fact that these weapons are being used to commit war crimes, genocide and crimes against humanity and also being used by these terror proxy proxies that are being used in Syria to topple Assad or even in Yemen to create a sectarian faction so as to continue the war so that people can continue to sell war, uh, weapons, etc. Um, the time has come for the British people to really stand up and say enough is enough because we here in Britain are at risk of being hounded worse than the Nazi war uh, criminals of the Second World War because what is being done to uh, the Yemen is worse than that in my view. 360,000 people are affected by cholera. It could be uh, perhaps uh, due to biological uh, weapons used there. It could be due to the blockade. Either way, it is systematic extermination of a people, of a country that is a sovereign country that has its sovereignty and it must be respected. They need to stop lying to the world. The Emiratis have taken the South and turned it into one big Watanamo Bay. They have 18 secret prisons where they are torturing people to death. This information is out there now in public uh, 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 hands because the Qataris have come out and confirmed it due to their own conflict there. Now, we're sitting here today in the comfort of our own homes or this studio or somewhere else, but I'm telling you, this six children per hour in Yemen are dying. And this is according to UNICEF uh, figures. Uh, nearly half a million people are now also facing death because of cholera. Not to mention the others who are being targeted by the illegal airstrikes. By the way, the Saudis have admitted in, on or about March this year that they have used 90,000 airstrikes on the poorest country in the region. That is, that is so disgusting. I, ha I can't find any other word to say but disgusting. So shame on us in Britain. Shame on our government. This is doing something worse than uh, the Nazi regime of the Second World War. But we, as citizens of the country, who care about the welfare of this country, we need to get up and say enough is enough. Uh, well, that's a very, very powerful uh, introduction. Uh, immensely powerful and emotional. Uh, you're right to allude to the fact that you have a higher opinion of British justice and British democracy than I do. Uh, I wish that both were as you think they are and therefore imagine that what happened in the High Court was somehow a slippage uh, from previously high standards. I don't myself uh, believe that. Uh, I have to, you'll have to forgive me, I have to say that nothing is comparable to the crimes of the Nazi uh, uh, regime in the 1930s and 40s. They were responsible for the deaths of almost 100 million people and the setting of the entire world on fire. But that doesn't minimize the extent of the crime against the people of Yemen and against the people of Bahrain and against the people of Saudi Arabia, against the people of Libya, 
against the people of Iraq, against the people of Syria that the Saudi regime is deeply involved in. And I share your excoriation of them in your uh, excellent uh, opening remarks. Um, we will, in the second segment, not just hear from the public and the Vox Pops, but we will hear from this uh, distinguished audience this evening. We want to, of course, curse the crimes of Saudi Arabia, but we also uh, want to look, and you yourself touched on it, how Britain, once the workshop of the world, which sailed the seven seas in ships that it made itself laden with the manufactures of the first industrial country in the world, has been reduced to a kind of pimp selling weapons to the dirtiest uh, regimes on the earth. We want to look not just, therefore, at the crimes there, but the crimes here that have left us in this unenviable situation. And we'll look, too, at the areas in the region, but also far wider than the region, who are being destabilized and being uh, hurt in fire and blood uh, by the terrorism which this Saudi tyranny is begetting. From Kuala Lumpur to Timbuktu, from Timbuktu to Toronto, in Paris, in Brussels, in London, uh, and in Germany, in Berlin, and uh, in Nice, in France, all over the world. This fanatic terrorism is spreading. And as you yourself said, it can be traced back ideologically, theologically, and financially to the regime that we're talking about here in Saudi Arabia. But all of that comes after this break. Kalimahara with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, but talking about Saudi Arabia. But the axis, if not of evil, then the sordid axis between the British government and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, elected by no one, accountable by no one, and dishing out death and destruction to its own people and people around the world using our weapons. Those Yemenis that are being bombed from the sky uh, that uh, have just been described are being bombed by British and American warplanes and the bombs and the rockets came from the same place. We took the Kale Mahorra camera out onto the streets of London to ask the people what they thought. Take a look at this. <music> What effective role do you think the UN can play in the Yemen conflict? I don't know enough about it. I really don't know enough about it. I think that the money or the petrol will be on the rights of people and will continue the war without any further. Hopefully mediation and negotiation between the two sides. Do you think it's been doing a lot? Uh, I haven't heard much, so I'd, I'd say no. Do you think the UN is already playing an effective role in the region? Big role, yeah. Well, obviously not. The people are still dying. So, no. What effective role do you think uh, the UN can play in, uh, in the region and in Yemen? Well, provided that people listen to them, they, can, they, they always play an effective role anyway. So, for me, they've got to be involved, they've got to engage with them. طبعا الصفقه الاخيره اللي كانت مع ترامب تبين لنا هل امريكا كانت تحترم حقوق الانسان او لا شيء طبيعي كان جرين لايت من ترامب ان هاكم اسلحه اعطونا فلوسكم لا بيفتكرون في حقوق حقوق انسان ولا اطفال اليمن
Well, there you go. That's the response, some of the responses. There will be more later uh, from uh, members of the public in Britain. Uh, not much evidence there, it has to be said, of the 67% of people who, according to the opinion poll, are against our trade with Saudi Arabia. Sir, you've got the microphone. Tell us what you think. Well, I think um, the biggest problem is that our values and our ambitions don't match. When, when your values are that you're the beacon of democracy in the world and your ambitions are to make money in whatever way you possibly can, then there is an obvious breakdown. And that is exactly what's happening. In terms of the United Nations, the United Nations itself, by, by agreeing to blanket uh, Resolution 2216 uh, against the entire country of Yemen, has effectively endorsed Yemen's death warrant. So for the United Nations to come and say that, okay, we are here to help in the real, in the real world, we call that hypocrisy. Because that is exactly what it is. Um, you know, the Security Council says, you do whatever you want to do. Go out, bomb them, do, you know, put a blockade on them. Effectively, almost, almost three years. It's going to be three years in, in, in March that the country is in a complete blockade. Now, people need to know 90% of Yemen's food is imported. How does that work? How is that fair in any, in any, any, any civilization in this world is, is absolutely beyond me. Um, the, uh, the high court over here just pretty much told the government, give the government a blank check to send more arms to Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, I am not a lawyer. I don't know much about law, but I can tell you one thing. What happened was, is going to have far-fetching effects on Yemen. And, and this is not correct by, by any shot. Um, we have been uh, very active in Yemen and we've been feeding people for, for two years, over two years now. Um, and the situation in Yemen is, can only be described by a couple of words. Yemen is a humanitarian black hole, literally right now. Um, you know, women go out and give birth in caves because they're scared they would be bombed and the children would die. Um, people are just dying of hunger left, right, and center. What is, what is being done? Where is the real world? It's nowhere to be seen. These are the most powerful countries getting together and collectively bombing a small sovereign nation. And we're talking about democracy? I don't think that is right. I think we should just come out and say, hey, you know what, we sided, we sided with the terrorists and went out and did what we had to do. Because Saudi Arabia is well known for, for manufacturing wars, for creating um, terror. So if they come here, create terror, and then tell the British government that, you know, we're here to help you, there's, there's probably going to be an attack somewhere here, here or, or somewhere else. Of course, we're going to think that, hey, you know what, Saudi Arabia is trying to keep us safe, but it is not. Well, uh, it is simply incredible for Saudi Arabia, the funder of, organizer of, armorer of terrorism around the world, to be held up as uh, people who can help us deal with terrorism. Uh, that, that's an absurd uh, proposition. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, they're not uh, backing every terrorist group and they may give us information about those terrorist groups that they're not backing. But the majority of the terrorism in the world is coming from them. Uh, I'm in a difficult situation with both you and Dr. Sharif that you really have a rose-tinted idea of what Britain is. Britain has no values of democracy. Britain supported the suppression of democracy all over the world. Britain occupied one quarter of the entire world and one third of the entire world's population. 
and brutally subjugated them whilst stealing their things. Britain is an imperialist country until now. Britain had a colony in Yemen uh, when the Beatles were at the top of the, of the hit parade. We're not talking about ancient history. Britain, Scottish soldiers were shooting dead people in the crater in Aden. When I was a swinging teenager, and I'm not that old, so it surprises me. It touches me in a way, but it, it's wrong, and I have an obligation to say it. The British don't care about democracy. The British state is an organized hypocrisy. It cares about looting other people's money. Equally, the courts are not some Arthurian uh, detached organ of British society whose role is to uphold truth and justice. This is a myth that I, I, I cannot allow to be perpetuated. The justice system is a pillar of the state, and the state is an imperialist, piratical, brigand state. And if they could have puppets in every country in the world so that we could loot their wealth, we would, and the courts would uphold it. There never was this golden age that, uh, in, that we've suddenly slipped from. On the contrary, as a matter of fact, the courts, the media, all the estates of the state, the media being the fourth estate, parliament. I was never, I'm not a lawyer either, but I was for 30 years a lawmaker. And therefore I know that the law is that you may not license the export of arms if those arms are likely to be used for internal repression or external aggression. You may well ask yourself what the arms would be for in that case. But we know that they are being used for the internal repression uh, of people either for religious or political reasons who are against the dictatorship in Saudi Arabia. And we know, it's not just that we know, we were involved. Britain was training the Saudi invaders of Bahrain. Britain is training the Saudi bombers of Yemen. Correct. There are British officers, officers of Her Majesty the Queen, in the military cell that is directing the war in Yemen. Enough from me. Yes, madam. Um, my name is Safa Shami. Assalamu alaikum. I agree with you that the British government and the courts are aware of everything what's going on in Yemen because they have effective rule in Yemen, selling weapons. They, they know definitely that their bombs are throwing all the people in Yemen, all around Yemen. No bridges, bridges have been cut. Medication still not received to the people of Yemen. Everything, they are bombing schools, hospitals, weddings, halls, everything. So the British government knows about everything. So stop making excuses that the government has nothing to do with that. Yes. Thank you, Robert Carr here. Uh, I just wanted to mention the type of work I'm into right now. I work within the Muslim community here. I also cover the Middle East as well as a journalist. And I also uh, am British myself, and of course I live here, so I, I deal with the British community as a whole. And uh, I think the problem is, and it was actually mentioned briefly by one lady from the public in the video we just saw, that uh, there are a lot of people in this country that genuinely don't actually know the details about what's going on there. They do know there's a conflict in Yemen. They do know we're involved, and they do know Saudi Arabia is responsible for a lot of the crimes being committed there. But apart from that, they don't know the ins and outs, and they don't really know the extent of what's happening there and our actual role that we're playing. And I think that that debate needs to be encouraged and developed because there are some journalists, for example, who do write about what's going on in mm. Yemen. Uh, 
but uh, how many people from the Muslim community, for example, contact those journalists after they write about Yemen and actually congratulate them and encourage them more so? Well, to many write Muslims more. in Britain support Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia makes that uh, possible by the copious use of bribery. Many do, but many also do not. Mm. There are, I would say, thousands and thousands of Muslims who are proud British Muslims, and there are thousands, if not millions, of British people who genuinely don't have a, a kind word to say about Saudi Arabia at all. That's true. But we need to, you know, there are a lot of people who, on Twitter, for example, they're very active with the hashtag campaigns, I'll save Yemen, Yemen crisis, and so on. But how many of them actually are prepared to write a letter to the local MP and urge them, we want you to go to Parliament and speak up about Yemen? I've done it myself, and a lot of MPs, unfortunately to say, are not very interested in speaking up about Yemen. But if we make more of an effort to push them and pressure them, there may be more results we see here. Some it's of the MPs interested. are remarkably interested in Saudi Arabia, on the other hand. Uh, and one wonders why, how it came to pass that when Jeremy Corbyn tabled a motion for the suspension of British arms sales to Saudi Arabia, not only did the entire Conservative bench oppose the motion, but well over 100 Labour MPs uh, failed to support him too. Even though, uh, for foreign viewers, I'll quickly explain, a three-line whip is a very serious instruction from your party that you must vote in the Commons for the party's motion. It's normally not broken by more than three or four, half a dozen, ten rebels, which oftentimes included me and Jeremy Corbyn, for that matter. But on this occasion, well over 100 Labour MPs failed to support this motion to suspend British arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Now, I'm asking myself why. I can't, for legal reasons, uh, be explicit. But I'm, it's a major mystery how... You're watching Kalimahara with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, talking about British involvement in Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabian involvement in the misery, death, and destruction in many other places, including in their own kingdom itself. We took the Kalimahara camera, as I said, out onto the streets of London. Here's more of what the people had to say. What do you know about the arms trade between the UK and Saudi Arabia? Very little. I don't really know a lot of things about that. Not a lot, to be honest. Not much. What do you know about the arms trade uh, between the UK and Saudi? Well, we sell a lot of arms to Saudi and we shouldn't sell as many as we do. It's really bad. Do you think Saudi has breached the international humanitarian law in uh, Yemen's conflict? Of course, Saudi has been a war crimes, even if it has been all the government to accept this and this is not what it has in the process. I think a lot of countries are breaching it, to be honest. In Yemen? Yemen? I'm not too sure what's happening in Yemen. It's a bit politically unstable, I don't know. Of course, the war is all the war on Britain, because the first war إلى النظام السعودي وهذا ما أثبتت أيضا المنظمات حصلت على أسلحة محرمة دولية كانت تستخدم ضد المدنيين يعني وصلت لمرحلة أن اليمن البنية التحتية تدمرت مستشفيات مدارس فطبعا شيء مؤسف واللوم يرجع إلى بريطانيا لأن يكون هالدعم الأول للنظام السعودي Well, that was uh, more of the voices uh, from London. I don't take back what I said. I think there's a phenomenal level of ignorance, uh, including at least 
visually, I thought so. People who ought to know better are certainly claiming uh, or actually don't have any knowledge of this subject at all, which is all the more remarkable given that the crime is being committed uh, using British arms, British weapons. It's being committed by uh, Britain's best friend in the Arab and Muslim world. Uh, when uh, a king dies in Saudi Arabia, they lower the flag on Downing Street to half-mast, and the royal family of Britain is sent out there to kiss the nose of the successor uh, tyrant when he is coming uh, back uh, into office. Uh, and it's all the more remarkable that Yemen, as I said earlier, was until the late 1960s actually a British colony, or at least part of it was. And yet the level of ignorance in Britain about this conflict uh, continues to dismay me at least. Madam. Um, hi, my name is Warda, and um, I, I just want to stress my opinion. Um, to start with, um, two, two wrong can make right. And I believe um, that the, the, the reason why Yemen is being um, swept under the carpet and no one hears about Yemen and no one wants to talk about Yemen, it's those people in power, those people who are in the high position and taking over Yemen um, for... Um, to defeat um, ISIS or to defeat a uh, terrorist uh, group. And, uh, and this message is for the uh, United States, for UK and, and the other Arab world. Uh, do, do not ignore Yemen people. Do not ignore them. They need a serious, serious help there. People are dying and they don't know why they're dying. They're dying for a reason that they never committed. They're dying because the message hasn't been cleared, sent to them. And this is what we need to send now and let them know that they, 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 it's not a terrorist uh, reason or it's not an ISIS reason. It's more than this. And well, we ISIS is understand. on the side of, uh, of Saudi Arabia in the war on Yemen. Um, Britain is not fighting terrorism. Britain is funding terrorism. Britain is helping to arm terrorism. If you look at the Syrian uh, question, for example, or the Libyan one before it, uh, Britain was deeply involved uh, in the case of Libya. We had a whole cell in Manchester of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, the clue was in the name. The Libyan Islamic Fighting Group was a terrorist group, but it was our terrorist group. And it was kept in Manchester and allowed to operate there in readiness for the day that they would be sent to Libya to overthrow the regime that was previously in power there. These, these people will be called zombies <laughs> because it, it will be hard to defeat them because once we get rid of the terrorists or the ISIS around the world, we have nobody there. We have no one there. So the new groups that they will emerge or they will come on this, the earth mm. of this face, they, 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 they'll, be same, they, they'll be called zombies, basically. And they're the, these groups it will be very difficult to defeat. This, this is my point. Well, they certainly are monsters, and uh, we created them. And we didn't create them as it happens in the Arab world. We created them in Afghanistan in the 1980s, when in the name of, uh, of uh, jihad and the mujahideen and all these other perversions, uh, of language and theology for that matter, we supported uh, people who metamorphosed into the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and, uh, and the rest. And we did so uh, without having read the Frankenstein novel to the end, because the whole point about the monster that Dr. Frankenstein created was that once it had been created, you could no longer control it. That's why it's called a monster. And that monster of fanatic extremism that we created, Britain and the United States, in the 1980s, is the father of the monstrous extremism that we have today. Let's go to the back of the room, this gentleman there. Thank you. Hi, George. My name is James. I do research. I'm just in intrigued in following up with something that the lady at the, and the gentleman at the front have said, which is 
praising Britain, but ultimately is letting down their argument, is, is to add to that. I've been looking at the BBC coverage of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is always referred to as its government, not its regime. Mm. And it's a telltale Good sign Good of point. where we're at in a discussion when the BBC uh, refers to a government, uh, to a, a regime as a government. You can hear the Foreign Office line. And for people who watch this around the world, who do have some hope with the name of the BBC, and I do perhaps during, if you cast your mind back, and before our times, during the Second World War, people will rely on good information from the BBC. The Foreign Office in Britain funds the BBC World Service. Whatever good the BBC World Service can do in imparting knowledge about developments around the world, it's not doing it anymore. It's towing a Foreign Office line. I've just been having a look at some comments that Frank Gardner, who was the BBC security correspondent who was attacked and wounded severely and his cameraman was killed in, um, in an attack in 2004 in Saudi Arabia. He doesn't make any reference to this. He talks in almost glowing terms of criticisms of Saudi, uh, of their government. He doesn't refer to the regime. He, re he, he does make statements of unelected, but it's not written in the language that the BBC would use of Syria. No. This is, and... and Syria is a dictatorship, yeah. a tyranny, uh, a regime. Saudi Arabia is a has a government, and that tells you, in a way, all that you need to know. But it's, the, it's, it's just the, the, the perception around the world that Britain has, as you've been saying earlier on, is, is that the, the courts will ensure that justice... That, that won't happen. That is not going to happen. Not. Dr Sharif. I fully understand your uh, negative views about the uh, system, but let me say something about me. I have been in the uh, legal system, education, experience and training during the, la the last 26 years of my life. I have seen everything from the uh, family courts to the uh, general civil courts elsewhere. I have seen the uh, property uh, department, chancery division, every part of the British system. I have been working in the criminal defence uh, field for a considerable number of years in my career, so I know what goes on. What I would like to tell you is this, that although it gets, gives the impression that justice is never done, the truth is justice does get done, that to a point where even I myself got overwhelmed with emotions at times when I saw justice being delivered by our own judges uh, to poor uh, clients who didn't have the money to afford the expensive legal system uh, through the legal aid system. I used to do housing cases in, in, uh, uh, through the legal aid system. So justice does get done. May I remind you of a couple of cases, for example, you get Stephen Lawrence. Yes, it takes a long time, and it's hard work, and it's very expensive, but eventually you get something done. The Stephen Lawrence case has taught us something that we were all oblivious to. Institutional racism was never addressed as an issue, but through the justice system and persistency and res resilience in pursuing your rights, you can get that done. Not a lot of people get this done. I know um, uh, it sounds like I am speaking from La La Land, but the fact is I am in the system and I know it. I'm not well, just... before you go any further, yeah. let me tell you that the yeah. example you give is the precise opposite. I, it's it... the precise opposite. Not at all. The, the justice system did not bring justice for Stephen Lawrence. No. The police corruptly investigated the crime. The, hold on. The courts acquitted the criminals. And the only reason why any of them, and not all of them, are behind bars is because of the work of a quite surprising newspaper, the Daily Mail, and the private prosecution brought by the family, not the justice system. So it's not a good example, though. No, no, but see, this is what I mean. You see, private prosecution itself is, is part of the justice system. It's not outside the justice system. That's one. The second thing is this actually explains the problem with the campaign against uh, Arms Trade case. Why? Um, the police have been lying to the court throughout, through their investigations, fabricating evidence. That is where everything has gone wrong because the police seem to have the uh, upper hand in relation to the defendant in that case. And, of course, the persistence and resilience of the family in pursuing the private prosecution eventually produced a result. Not the perfect situation, but it is possible to get there eventually, which is where I'm coming in here. In the case of Campaign Against Armed Streets, we have 100-page legal opinion written by the leading QCs of this country. And uh, I am very, very uh, doubt, I very much doubt that uh, the, the, the uh, 
operations, the, the dodgy operation that took place at the lower level, which is the high court level, is going well, to happen at the higher level. Well, recognize the word high court as being a lower level. It is. The high court is a very high level. No, no, it, it is. It is the high court. No, no, it is, like, because that, the, it is the high You're court. You're kidding yourself. No, no, uh, This look. is not the first time I've had to say this to you. Look, look, sir. You're absolutely fooling yourself. Look, sir. That these decent judges gave that judgment only because the police lied to them and they are so naive they didn't know the police were lying to them. But that's... Once it gets to the, to the super-duper judges, yes. there'll be no more lying. You, you really me, are living in life. Let, let me explain. Let me explain. I am the lawyer, after all, and I am the expert on this one. Let me I explain. I was 30 years a lawmaker. Maker. That's a bit higher than a lawyer. And then 26, so don't patronize me. Not this, no disrespect to you, sir, but look, the High Court is on par with the County Court in terms of the court structure. Upper than the High Court is the Court of Appeal, and above that is the Supreme Court. Do you see what I'm talking? There is a level of expertise in the judiciary itself in the jurisprudence of this uh, country's constitution. So the constitution. judges in the high court were too stupid to see. No, the no, lying to no. Them? But the way we look at it from the legal perspective is a lower court on par with the county court and the magistrates court. Whereas the court of appeal is higher and the supreme court is higher. And with the 100-page legal opinion, you're confident. I am. We're going to go somewhere because the leading QCs themselves cannot be dismissed out of hand because it is. We'll come back and destruction talk about of our own when, system, uh, and I don't think when, we will allow that to when, happen. When, the, when these uh, higher courts uh, have their say, we'll, we'll return to this issue. But the secret justice that you refer to is, of course, now becoming the norm in Britain, in this wonderful judiciary system. Uh, Jack Straw, the former foreign secretary, and Sir Mark Allen, the former head of MI6, are both very soon to uh, go uh, before the courts on trial for involvement in the illegal rendition of Libyan prisoners and their torture uh, by the Gaddafi regime, having been delivered to Gaddafi by uh, the um, claimant, says, uh, the involvement of the British security services. And just yesterday, Mr. Justice Popplewell, I'm not making his name up, Mr. Justice Popplewell said that the case would be heard largely, largely in secret. Therefore, the victims of the torture and abuse would not hear uh, what was being said uh, in defense of Jack Straw and the former head of uh, MI6 and would not have their day in court in any meaningful uh, sense. And this after the government tried to have the case thrown out altogether uh, on the basis that Straw was uh, uh, somehow above the law as the uh, foreign secretary. So secret uh, justice uh, is going to be increasingly the norm in Britain on these kind of uh, laws, maybe on housing matters and other uh, lower level issues, children's courts and so on. Uh, there is, uh, as there would be in most uh, countries like ours, uh, a decent justice system. But in political cases, uh, cases that go to the heart of the state's interest, I'm afraid you shouldn't look too hard for justice. Uh, sir, do you want to come back in? The gentleman in the middle, after this. I'll be right back. With me, George Galloway, on Almaydeen TV, talking increasingly about Yemen and the murderous brutality of the Saudi war against the poorest country in the region using British and American weapons and indeed security uh, personnel, uh, special forces, and other experts. The floor is yours, sir. Go ahead. Thank you very much, George. Um, just to defend Saudi Arabia, I think we've been unfairly picking on them and accusing them of always. Uh, supporting terrorists that want to uh, topple various regimes. Uh, there are Saudi tanks in Bahrain which are helping the government stay in power. How about that? There are. Uh, there are Saudi Stability tanks in, in, uh, in Bahrain uh, maintaining the uh, rule of another uh, British chosen, unelected, uh, brutal dictatorship, a sectarian dictatorship with, bereft of any popular support having to import 
uh, people to actually do their fighting for them and having to bring Saudi tanks across the causeway. Uh, who made the tanks in Bahrain? Any idea? Uh, Britain. I don't know. Well, good a guess. guess. <laughs> Very good guess. Uh, sir, would you like to uh, comment on what you've heard up till now? Uh, yeah, I just want to make one thing very clear. I, um, I have absolutely no faith in the justice, justice system here because of what has happened, and I know it will happen over and over again. Um, you know, but the core issue at hand is, is that people basically need to be educated when, when we see what people on the streets say. Um, they can only tell you what they read in the media, and we all know... If at all. I mean, there's yeah. not much in the media. Yeah, exactly. And, and we all know that at some point or the other, Saudi Arabia actually bought prime time um, um, within all the TV stations, a few of the TV stations, um, at, at premium prices, and basically just told them that you're not going to talk anything about Yemen. Um, Similarly, they have bought hundreds of thousands of subscriptions of newspapers um, so that nothing is written about Yemen. So, you know, whatever you read in the media is pretty much it. And, and we know that, you know, this is going to be all for Saudi Arabia. Presumably it's, than, it's worse than the United States. Isn't yes. It? Like everything else is. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's exactly, that has been going on since the war started. We know that. And they have been doing this um, around the world. They've been buying a lot of media and, and turning it around. That way they, they look good. But there is no way of making a Saudi look good. I'm sorry, but, you know, there, there really isn't. Especially uh, in a gold Lamborghini. Exactly. And, um, you know, so they, what they're doing in this country is wrong. Do you know that the United States has over 1,200 seminaries 1,200 Wahhabi seminaries teaching the ideology within the United States. And we're saying the Saudis are terrorists somewhere else? Well, I don't think so. Yeah, it is a remarkable uh, thing. 13 of the 19 mass murderers on 9-11 were Saudi citizens, uh, yet the United States is in league with the country from which those uh, terrorists came and attacking countries that had no involvement in terrorism of any kind. It is uh, an extraordinary thing, not just other Arab countries, but Iran, for example, which is the number one enemy yeah. of the United States, is the victim of terrorism. Oh, absolutely. The United States is in league with the terrorists who are engaged uh, in it. Let me uh, go to the young woman here. Uh, here's the uncomfortable truth. Virtually every Muslim in Britain and around the world was against the invasion of Iraq, except for the most powerful and those whose pockets had been filled. The truth is, and I made this point to Robert, actually most Muslims in Britain, insofar as they have a view, support the Saudi view on Yemen because they have bought into the fake sectarianization uh, of the conflict. They have bought into the lie that Yemen is being attacked because it is a Shiite insurrection against Sunni power and therefore has to be defeated or the Shiites are going to be winning everywhere. These are very uncomfortable truths, but I believe they are truths. Go ahead. Um, actually, Yemen has uh, a significant location. It does. And has fortune. It's not a poor country. But you can say that the corrupted government and corrupted rulers, yeah, I agree with you. But uh, it's not a poor country and has a remarkable location, has a uh, sea, um, a fish fortune, etc. So... Um, it's one of the most uh, important countries in, uh, in the Arab world. And um, definitely, yeah, it's not like uh, Iraq, but still 
is a very important country. I mean, it's familiar, it's known to everyone. And especially Britain knows Yemen, how it's an important country. And yeah, so I can't agree anymore, but I'm still convinced that uh, the people and the media and knows about what's going on in Yemen, but still they want to raise their economy uh, and kill people as much as they can in order to, you know, to uh, live a good life. But uh, all the poor people go to hell and there are international organizations, I uh -huh. mean, led by British people, uh -huh. like Care International, Oxfam, is it a, a British? Oxfam? Yeah. Yes, I, they know definitely these, I mean. Yes, they do, and uh, some of them have done their best to bring it to a, a wider audience. But what's your view on what I said about the attitude of the British Muslims to the conflict? Most British Muslims are on Saudi Arabia's side in the conflict. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because, because they have accepted the fake sectarian narrative mm. that this is a war uh, by proxy against uh, a Shiite tide which they think is rising everywhere. Yeah, because they, uh, they are, some of them, ignorant and they believe about this, I mean, uh, rubbish, we can say. Because some European countries, they say there, in, there is no science, Iranian science inside Yemen. They say it. They say it. Some uh, journalists uh, went to Yemen and they say they will check the Iranian militants, and, but they didn't find anyone. There's no, they just no, found Yemeni no fighters Iranian. defending on their countries. Indeed. That's it. And uh, as I pointed out before, I think uh, to you on television that... Uh, of course, the, there's no shortage of weapons in Yemen, and there never has been a shortage of weapons. There's and no evidence whatsoever of any Iranian involvement in the war in Yemen. Neither are the uh, fighters uh, who are opposing Saudi Arabia, neither are they Shiites. Mm. Uh, and therefore, the entire thing is a fake narrative. And they say the trade exchange between Iran and other Gulf countries. Well, uh, between uh, Emirates and uh, Iran, Dubai between and Saudi and, uh, and Iran. Yeah, exactly. So, where is the trade exchange and business between Yemen and Iran? Indeed, so. Zero, Indeed. or at least some small projects. Doctor, last word to you. Um, you're confident that this can be won in the courts. Um, we'll see uh, about that. I hope that you are right. What are the principal arguments that your lawyers will be putting to the Court of Appeal? Before I get to that point, I just want briefly to say why the majority of the British Muslim have been misled and are happy to accept this false narrative. That is because majority of our centres, Muslim centres in the UK and mosques, are funded by the Saudi regime. As you know, we have a report by the Home Secretary which is not allowed to be Being released. Suppressed. Yes. And so, suppressio veri, suggestio falsi. It's a legal concept expressed in Latin, which means the suppression of the truth is a suggestion of falsity. So there's a lot of lying, misleading, and distortion and dodginess going on. When I do speak passionately about the system, I speak from the point of view as a British citizen. I want the welfare of my country to be looked after. And good men like you in the system could perhaps listen to us and then pass that message on and hope that things can be changed and improved and we can get rid of these dodgies messing around the system because it is in our collective interest for this country to be looked after. We all live here. This is our country. Um, the situation about... Uh, the Saudi and, and uh, involvement and the commission of all these hideous crimes, I know some people say to me when I say this is worse than last is that it is wrong for me to say that, but I will say this. Stephen O'Brien, who is the OCHA, the uh, humanitarian coordinator in uh, Yemen for the UN, said that the humanitarian situation in Yemen is worse than the Second World War. What can be worse than the Second World War, George? So that's there. As far as the law is concerned, I'm a fighter and I don't stop until I get somewhere, however long it takes me. That is the quality of me. I suppose it's the Yemeni gene. You can call it the Yemeni gene. 
two years, three years, three years later, we're still solidly carrying on. You can see our people going to the Saudi borders and teaching them a valuable lesson that they will never forget. They're terrified. Their soldiers are running, running away like chicken. And that two years after all the horrors that have been committed against our country, we're still standing and continuing, and we will. And as far as this legal case is concerned, I'm not alone. I have an international team of expert lawyers, very senior to me, who know what they are doing. And we know things take time, but you will see how we're going to make a massive uh, difference. I'm confident that I don't look to humans, basically, at the end of the day, and I'm not wearing this hijab as a fashion statement. I'm wearing this hijab because I sincerely believe in God. I know human beings are very powerful, like, for example, the bully boys in the Security Council at, U at the UN level, messing up the whole world without taking responsibility, without applying their own laws. The UN is almost gone, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of self-disrespect. But I believe in God, who I know is more powerful than everything else that's out there. And that God, who I have sincere faith in, I know is going to see me through this case. And these criminals, these criminals will not escape liability. And anyone who has been working with them, I can assure you, for as long as I'm breathing, and I am passing the case already to the new generations, training them and, ex and, and showing them the ropes, they will be taking it after me. So if I die tomorrow, there's a whole team of lawyers that will, will be taking this over. Those who have been aiding and abetting this brutal regime brutalizing the innocent people of the Yemen will not get away with blue murder, I can guarantee you that. For, the, for, for eternity, we shall pursue them, for eternity. And when I say for eternity, I mean it. This life and the other life, we are praying to God that these crimes don't go unpunished. They will be punished here and they will be punished there. For as long as I'm breathing and those people are breathing and generations of young Yemenis breathing, these criminals will be hounded and, pers and, and, and pursued. And that goes to the vicarious liability point, which is anyone who has aided and abetted mm. these crimes. They will, we will not let go of this one, I promise you. Wherever we get justice, we will get it, whether it's in the UK courts, international criminal court, systems change. Things change overnight. Yesterday, well, a few a while ago, I, I call it yesterday because it sounds like it happened yesterday. Berlin Wall came down overnight. One day there used to be a country called Yugoslavia, it's now been cut to pieces. There used to be the uh, Soviet Union, which it isn't now Russia. Things can change in the world, and the bully boys of the Security Council will not continue their bullying of the rest of the world and uh, being the way they are. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to say this. It's been a remarkable discussion marked, punctuated by the extremely powerful uh, case made by the audience and in particular uh, Dr. Kim Sharif. I hope that it has shed some light on the great issues involved. And uh, all I say in passing is that a scorpion stings because it's a scorpion. And the British state acts the way that it does, because it's a scorpion too. I've been George Galloway. This has been Kalimahorra on Al Mayadeen Television. Thanks for watching.